So, um, yeah, those are some individuals from our youth and young adults group. Uh, Jaden uh, has been there for four years, like he said. Uh, he came, he's coming up uh, through our youth group now. And uh, it's cool because Jaden's been there for four years. Brandon, who uh, spoke in the middle, at the beginning there, he has been here for like six months since we started in the summer. And Hanbo and Joanna have been here for maybe a month. Um, and to see, to see the snapshots of like, okay, like new people are coming and they're, they're catching this vision and they can be a part of it to the extent that they're talking about our group on the, on the screen within one month. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I just wanted to start out by introducing myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Holsworth. I'm the youth and young adults pastor here at Victory Church and I've been here for about three years. Um, and in this three years, we've seen so many amazing things happen uh, in our youth group and in our uh, young adults group that just started in the summer. Um, and so this morning, we're going to be talking about what it means to be a witness. And so let's, uh, let's all stand together and uh, pray before we get started. Dear God, I thank you for every single person in this room. God, I, 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 just, I pray that every person here would understand that they belong here and that they're cared for. God, I ask that no person here would doubt at all that they, the person next to them, to the left and the right in front of them, that, they, that they're cared for here, that they're seen, and that they belong here, that they are not an outsider, but they are an honored guest. God, I ask that this morning, as we dive into your word, that everybody here would be given an opportunity to meet you, that everybody here would learn more about you, that we would grow deeper in our relationship with you, that we would continue to be transformed into your likeness, God, that we would meet you here. God, fill this place with your spirit. Um, yeah, give us, give us what we need today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so uh, every Sunday we have a ton of new people, and so I actually want to introduce myself and share my story uh, with you this morning as it ties into what we'll be talking about. So um, if you've heard this a hundred times, especially those youth group people, they've heard it a hundred times, uh, I'm going to be sharing my story again, but don't check out. I might, you know, say it differently. Who knows? Anyways, um, I was born into a pretty crooked situation. Um, both of my parents were drug addicts when I was born. And when I was, by the time I was the age of two, uh, both my parents were not quite in the picture, um, and I ended up being taken in by my grandmother. You see, uh, my grandmother ended up taking me in and caring for me, but she, she was elderly and Japanese, and so there was, a, there was not much she could do by herself. And so she did the best she could, but she prayed for me every day. That was the thing. She prayed for me every single day and made sure I got home by the time the lights were out. That was about it. <laughs> Um, but she prayed for me every day. Um, regardless of those prayers, though, for the first 14 years, you see, I walked in the direction that statistics would say I would have walked. You see, statistics would have said, you're going to end up just like your parents, regardless of whether they're in the picture or not. So I actually started, like, I hated that idea, but I, but I saw myself doing that because I didn't have an identity, I didn't feel worth, I didn't feel loved, and so I was looking to place after place after place to get that kind of affirmation, and so I was looking all over the place until I was 14, and I ended up going far from God, like, I wasn't, I wasn't even anywhere close to God, I was certainly going to end up like my parents. Like, if you take a snapshot of Jeremy at 14, you, you would have never never thought he would have graduated high school. Nonetheless, half the other stuff that God has done in my life. But you see, when I was 14, that's where I got invited to a youth group. I got invited to a youth group where I was introduced to this Jesus. And it was at this youth group that I started exploring more and more my questions about who I am, according to the Bible. And I went on this camp, and at this camp they preached about the gospel of how God made me and he wants, he wants me, like there's a purpose that God loves me and he, he just wants to be in a relationship with me. Um, and the number one thing that stuck out for me when I met Jesus there is that it was not enough that I just said that God was real. It wasn't enough that I had this intellectual affirmation that God is real or that the Bible is true. I actually had to get up and follow him. You see that verse in Luke 9, 23, where it says, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. You see, that's an action verse. If you want to be my disciple, whole life change direction. Like, like it wasn't simply a, a, I say this with my mouth. No, I had to actually believe it in my heart and walk it out. That's when it clicked. 
all of a sudden it wasn't just this book. All of a sudden this was life, that God's word was life. And so that, that's when the, the switch flipped for me. And the miracle happened in my life where I went from, I was going to end up just like my parents, but God saved me. And, you know, I went to Bible college. I just wanted, I wanted to talk about this book, and I wanted to talk about this God who saved me and has saved my friends. And, and I just, there was nothing else I was going to do. I'm not too good at too many things. Uh, but this one thing I think I can handle for now. <laughs> um, I can talk about God and what he's done. And, man, like, I, that's my wife, by the way. I met her in college. <laughs> Give her a round of applause. She's great. She puts up with me. Her name's Winter. I got married. Um, my son is a year and a half almost, um, and man, my son, my son gets a life that I never had, that I never even had an opportunity to have. My son gets to live in a household where God is there, and where he knows that he has two parents who love him. Like, those are, th- that is a miracle. Like, my son existing in the place that he is, that's a miracle. The fact that God saved me out of where I was, that is a miracle, And so I stand in front of you talking to you about this stuff because God did a miracle in my life. And so that that segues into what we're going to be talking about this morning. You see, it's next-gen morning. You know, we have our youth group and our young adults group. I'm going to pause for everyone who's between the ages of 12 and 18, between the grades of 6 and 12. We have youth group here every Friday. It is at this youth group that we connect with one another, we worship God together through music, and we dive into a message, we go, we go into God's word, and then we break off into small groups. Um, and all the while, everyone's having a really great time. Like, everyone just likes each other. Like, really, though? Like, everyone actually cares about each other, and that's such an awesome thing to see. When I go to youth group on Friday, I know I'm going to see some of my friends. Um, yeah, anyways, youth group's awesome. You should go to it. That is 7 p.m. Friday. Friday, 7 p.m. Everyone hear me? Say it with me. Friday, 7 p.m. Now you're going to hear that again, but about a Wednesday. (laughs) So this summer we started a young adults group um, that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And it's at this young adults group um, that we, you know, we started up with the young adults in our church and we do some, we do similar stuff, just we do it up here. Uh, We do worship we dive into God's word together, and we also do small groups, and it's just a beautiful place to see young adults come and worship God. We've seen people saved in both of these ministries, and man, I have story after story of what's happened in these ministries, but I'll get there in a bit. Um, so with these ministries, I wanted to tell you about it. Like, I wanted to be able to communicate to you what youth group is about, what young adults is about, and I, I wrestled with how I would talk about it. Like, how do I describe this big thing to me, to to everybody, that they would understand why we do what we do? And I I actually started thinking about what the lesson was from this Friday and Wednesday. We talked about a story in John, John chapter 6. And everyone probably knows the beginning of this story. Jesus takes bread and feeds the 5,000. He feeds the 5,000. He gives them a miracle. And then Jesus went across the lake. And so all the people that were there to see the miracle and ate the bread, they followed him across the lake. They sought after him. And they're like, Jesus, can you do that miracle again? Can you do something else? And Jesus looks at them. He's like, look, I know why you came after me. I know that you're here just for the bread. Like, I know that that you don't get it. And so I want to tell you. So Jesus tells them, like, look, it's not enough that I feed you today. Look, I want to give you the bread of life. I want you to get it. Like, I want you to understand the gospel. And so he tells them, look, it's not about the gluten. It's about me. (laughs) And in response, they all left. Like, it's got to be a heartbreaking moment in the gospels because you see earlier in the the other, the ways, sorry, when they tell the story of feeding the 5,000, it almost always opens with Jesus had compassion for them. He had compassion for them. And then you see this moment where they all leave And it's a really, like, dramatic moment. I I love moments like that in the gospel where you see something like, like, that feels hopeless. Like, there's what, 300 people in this room right now? 5,000 people walked the other direction, and they didn't get it. And so there's this moment where he turns to the 12 disciples, and he says, are you also going to leave? Will you go too? 
I want to pause there. Will you leave because they're leaving? That question for our youth and our young adults comes up so often. There's a statistic in North America that two-thirds of young people will leave the church by the time they're 18, and so two-thirds of all of their friends are walking away. Like, they, they see it. Like, they're going to, and if you haven't, you're going to. There will be moments in your life, even if you're not a youth, there are mo- you, if you've been following Jesus for more than a year or two, you, you know there are moments. Are you going to go with them? Like, are you also going to walk? But there's this amazing, beautiful moment. Peter, Peter turns to Jesus in response to that question. And he says, Lord, to whom would I even go? You alone have the words of eternal life. See, Peter got it. Peter knew Jesus enough to know that outside of this, there's no way I'm going to have joy in life. That outside of this, there's no way that anything outside of this God is going to give me value. So that's why youth and young adults exist. You see, we have to cultivate relationships with Jesus that's one-on-one so that when everyone else leaves, the youth at this church would know Jesus enough to be able to say, where would I go? That's why we do it. Who cares if there's 100 people in this building? If in 10 years we can't show for anything, that in 10 years they're gone, that in 10 years they're with the 5,000 who walked, we failed. And so every last bit of energy that we spend on our youth and our young adults is for that moment. It's for that moment. Even for people who don't know Jesus at all, that they would come to know him and also be able to stay and remain in him. And so that's why, our, that's why our youth and young adults exist. And I, just a caveat there, we do not exist outside of this church, period. Like, the survival of youth in, t- in terms of, like, following Jesus, guess what? Youth expires. They're going to graduate from youth group. They're not going to graduate from church. And so our win, our win isn't that we have some passionate youth on a Friday. Our win is that we have a vibrant church filled with all generations, that on the worship team, you could point and say, oh, that's a young person. That's a young person who's serving with the other generations, that in the resource center, that at ushering, that at every bit of this church is integrated, the next generation, and that we are not trying to do anything on our own, but we are coming alongside the church with the church because we are the church. So that in se- when we're 70, we could say, where would I go? That's what, that's what I want to do. Like, that's for me and my friends. I don't care if I'm a pastor. Like, I want to be able to look at my friends and say, where would I go? For the rest of my life, that's it. And so that's it. That's why we do what we do. That's why we want to see you know, your sons and your daughters come to our youth group because we want to partner with this together. We want to see them follow Jesus. And man, we have a really fun time along the way. And so you know, we have 100 unique, either young adults or youth in this building on a Friday or a Wednesday. And man, we've seen so much growth. We've seen so much growth. And... I just wanted to talk about like a couple stories from this, these groups. Like, man, one of them, this young lady, well, she's probably my age. I'm also a young man. Anyways, uh, <laughs> this woman at our young adults group, um, she did not know Jesus at all. You know, she was pregnant. Her husband's an atheist. Like, like, like she was in a rough place. And, you know, she, lots of depression and stuff. Like, like she had it real hard. Like, you look at her life and you're like, man, that. That was not easy. That was not a good go. And like a sane, rational person would have looked at this person's life and said, no way. No hope. There's no way this person's going to grow. There's no per- like, like a rational person, like a normal person, a reasonable person would say, there's no way. But man, four weeks ago, this young lady was at, one of our, pra- was at, was at our prayer night, and she accepted Jesus into her life. And man, when I tell you that this was one of the most amazing experiences that I've had as a bystander, like every single week she's experiencing things with new eyes. Like she's a brand new person. Like life came up. She has life in her eyes. And man, she's seeing it. Her husband's heart's starting to soften. He's seeing her growth. And so I lose it whenever I think about these stories. And there's like 10, 20 of these stories in our youth group. And now they're starting to butt up from our young adults group. Like when we set out, 
with our young adults group, we actually really wanted um, to, to retain. Like our big dream was that the 18-year-old who graduated had a place and that they would stay connected and stay with the church and, and, and abide and, and stick with this Jesus, right? But we are seeing like by the tens, for now, young adults who left coming back. Like, that's insane. That was bigger than our prayers. Like, our prayers are that the walls would be built up, that we would be strong, that we would have a place for them to connect, and now we're seeing two-thirds come back. And now we're seeing brand new people who have never met Jesus come and meet Jesus. And I, it's awesome. And so again, Friday nights at 7 p.m. <laughs> for youth. Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for young adults, <laughs> the ages of 18 to 30 for young adults. Um, and so that leads us into our passage for this morning. You thought I was done. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking all about this idea to be a witness. And so with this story is about Peter and his friend John. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to read this verse from Acts chapter 1 of something Jesus said before he went to heaven. It says, in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, the thing that I want you to get from this is that you are to be witnesses. What is a witness, Jeremy? So a witness <laughs> is exactly what you would imagine a witness to be. You saw something. Now you're being asked to talk about that thing you saw. <laughs> it's that simple. Like even in like, you know, think of like criminal cases and court stuff. Like it, a judge will bring a witness up and what will they do? They'll say what they've seen, say what they've heard. And usually the witness, like if they were there and they have like a decent idea of what happened, it doesn't matter what age they are. Like they don't have to have a degree to be a witness to see that thing happen down the road. Like to be a witness is what God wants from us. What I just did when I told my story at the beginning, that was me being a witness. Because let me tell you, that story's not about me. Like, it really isn't. That, that's about a God who saves people who are incredibly broken and gives them life and purpose. That's who that's about. So I'm going to be a witness to that. Because I saw and I heard God do that in my life. And when I talk about that young lady, like, I'm being a witness to what God did in her life. I don't... Like, there are some nights where I talk about something that's, like, really sophisticated, and I feel like, you know, my degree really helped there. Most of the time, I'm just talking about how awesome God is and what he did. And I, didn't, I don't use my degree for that. <laughs> I just talk about it. Like, I've been doing the same thing since I was, like, 15. <laughs> it hasn't changed much. God did something awesome. I talk about it. It's awesome. <laughs> because someone told me, you're supposed to be a witness. And so that leads us into our story. You see, Peter and John, they were doing ministry, uh, and basically, they, they healed a man, and it was awesome, and everyone was amazed. They healed a man in Jesus' name, and then all these people were, like, gathered around, so Peter's like, all right, I'm going to use this opportunity to preach, and so he preaches a sermon to them, and, like, 3,000 people come to know Jesus, and it's awesome, and then the government, are like, they're like, mm, we don't like that. <laughs> We don't like that. That seems messy. That seems like it would get in the way of what we want to do. That doesn't agree with our beliefs. That, they persecute John and Peter. You see, in Acts chapter 4, verse 1, it says, While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching, and the people, sorry, were teaching the people, that through Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people heard their message and believed it. So the number of those who believed now totaled 5,000. So they get arrested. And I love this story because they get arrested, and then the next morning they get brought before the council. They get brought before the council, and the members of the council were amazed. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Think about that. Be a witness, right? I'm an ordinary guy. You're ordinary. We can relate to them because we're ordinary just like they are. 
And so when I say that, I mean like you are supposed to be a witness. There's no I'll wait until. Like if you follow Jesus, there's something to witness to, I promise. (laughs) Something happened. (laughs) You're supposed to be a witness. And a witness can be anyone. Um, The last verse there, I think that's the defining thing because you don't have to be anything other than ordinary except... (laughs) Like, the qualifying attribute of a witness is that they saw the thing. And so at the end, it says, they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's the key. Where in your life have you seen Jesus show up? And I don't mean, like, a big firework moment. I mean anywhere. You could probably count ways that things that you're thankful for. You can probably count things that God has done for you when he's comforted you in those small moments, when he showed up for you in that little prayer. Or even the big ones. Some of us have had firework moments where God showed up and just changed something inside of us. Like, I've had that. And, like, not everyone has to, but, like, let me tell you, both big and small moments are so, so valuable. So you've seen something. Be a witness. Anyone can be that witness. And at the end here, it says, you know, they, they, they chastise Peter and John. They're like, look, you have to stop talking about this Jesus. We can't arrest you because of all the people that follow you, but you have to stop. You have to stop preaching. You have to stop talking about this. And the response is beautiful. The response captures the essence of what it means to be a witness. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. He didn't say, I will not stop preaching. He didn't say, I will not stop teaching. You see, the, the thing that was important to Peter here, apparently, is that he won't stop telling what he's seen and heard. I won't stop being a witness. Church, we're supposed to be witnesses. We're supposed to be witnesses. And to be a witness is to tell of what you have seen and heard. And so I I don't want to leave you with this idea that you just need to be a witness and give you no practical tools to do so. You know, there's this uh, three-step way to tell your testimony that I could probably do in three sentences. I always get carried away and make it 100, but I could do it in three sentences. <laughs> um, so the number one practical thing, if you're, right, if you're a person who writes stuff down, get your notepad out. <laughs> this tool is like awesome for me. So I'm telling you because it was important to me. Like I used it at least three times in this sermon just now, this, this concept. So number one, learn your three-step testimony. The first step, where were you before Jesus? Where were you before Jesus? For me, I was far. Like, I was far, and I was not living right, and I was going to die. That's where I was before Jesus. Two is remember that God is the main focus. And I, I, I want to point that out, because a lot of times we'll get into storytelling, and all of a sudden we're the main character. All of a sudden we're the ones who did that thing. But it's important to remember through the whole thing is that God is the main focus, We have to bring glory to God with our testimony. Otherwise, we're witnessing to ourselves, and we are really weak and frail and honestly not quite as interesting. So bring glory to God with your witnessing, with your testimony. Wait, I totally skipped something. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, wow. I did not do that in the first service. Thank you for catching me. Um, <laughs> sorry. So that three-part testimony, the first one is where you were before Jesus. The second one is how Jesus met you in whatever way. For me, it was at a camp. And the thing that stuck out to me is that I had to actually do something about it. So step one, where were you before? Step two, how did you meet Jesus? And step three, what, what has happened since? How has God transformed you since that day? That's your three-point testimony, like three sentences. So like, if you're writing stuff down, write that one down. Again, Sorry. A little scatterbrained. Just blame it on the youth, kids. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, two, remember that God is the main focus. Remember that God is the main focus and you're not. Even in my life, like, God saved me. I had no hope on my own. It was God who acted in my life that changed everything. Three, don't downplay God's work in your life. Like, I love you guys. Some of you, some of you are so humble, and it's, it, I'm not always that humble, but some of you are so humble that you'll like downplay your story a little bit. I love it because we're in a theme where we're talking about people's stories and someone will tell me, oh, you know, it's not that exciting. Not a lot happened. Um, and they won't actually tell their story because of that notion. 
Don't downplay God's work in your life. Because number two, if God's the main focus, you got to tell about it. If God's the focus, you have to, it's him you're bragging about, not you. God is somebody that you're, like, you're, God's the person you're going to be giving glory to. God is who you're going to give glory to, not yourself. And so down, don't downplay your story. Like, for me, like, I know that I'm in a place right now where I, I like, my son has everything I never had. I have a, a wife, and, like, we are living a good life right now. And I, let me tell you right now, that brings glory to God, not me. Because I didn't earn any of that. God saved me from nothing. Like, I had nothing. Everything I have is because of what God did for me. And so that means that I can't downplay God's work in my life. You know, I come up here and tell my story a lot, and I honestly, it gets tiring sometimes. Like, literally, like, young adults, people, youth people, you'll know I share it a lot. There was a time where I didn't for a while because I thought, you know, I don't, I'm, I, I'm sick of talking about myself. And it dawned on me, like, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the God who saved me, and I have, I'm the only person who has that story in this way, so I have to tell it. That's, that's what it means to be a witness. What have you seen? What have you heard? And in closing, I, I just want to focus on this idea that your story bears God's fingerprints. 